This is Super Yacht News with the Sysman. Hi, welcome back to the channel. Okay, so uh, there's a, obviously a big story out right now about the missing submersible. It's a little bit off our beat here at the Sysman Super Yacht, but uh, we've had a lot of people contacting us, asking us if we're going to cover the story. Um, it's all over the news right now, but we thought we'd give you some information and, and some observations that have not been missed by the mainstream media as well. Okay, in the unlikely event that you haven't already seen the story, a submersible went missing diving to the Titanic wreck uh, with five people on board. Um, initially, they were believed to be all employees of the company, but it's now come to light that there are um, one pilot on board and four civilians, basically, who are paid to go to the Titanic, one of them being the British-born billionaire Hamish Harding, who's the chairman of private plane firm Action Aviation. Another one is the founder of Ocean Gate himself. That's the company that does the trips down to the Titanic. Uh, and his name is Stockton Rush, and he's believed to be on board. And there's also the teenage son of another paying passenger. Now, the vessel at this moment that we film this is, is a, has been missing for, uh, well, since Sunday. Um, so yeah, it's it's now Tuesday. So they've got about halfway through their oxygen supply, assuming that they are still alive. The vessel went missing, as we said, diving on the Titanic. And that is about 347 nautical miles southeast of Newfoundland in Canada, or, which is about 400 regular miles or 640 kilometers. Um, now, there's been a little bit of confusion about the type of vessel that this is. A lot of people call it a sub submarine, some people call it submersible. Now, the correct terminology for this vessel is a submersible. Um, a submarine would leave a port, you know, it's like a boat. It, it, it leaves a port, goes out to sea, can dive, come back up, go back into port, has a crew on board. That's a submarine. Uh, a submersible is a vessel that uses a mothership and is launched from the mothership into the water. It goes down to dive, comes back and is recovered by the mothership and then uh, you know the people get out and they stay on that ship. Now there are a few types of uh, submersibles. There's a tethered submersible and an untethered submersible. This is something that's not really been mentioned in the news articles that we've seen. A tethered submersible obviously has a tether connected to it. In that tether, there are uh, they are able to communicate with voice and even send video back from the seabed. And also, I believe, but I'm not 100% sure, but I believe they can also pump oxygen in through that tether as well. Now, an untethered obviously doesn't have any of those capabilities. Uh, now, why would you use untethered when you can have a tethered system? The, the untethered submersible offers more freedom for the vessel to move around, but I would, I would say that it's inherently more dangerous because of the communications issues, which we'll go into in a second. Basically, the communications that they have uh, they don't have any radio communications because radio waves don't go on through the water. Um, they have a rudimentary system, which is like a sonar system. Uh, the vessel sends a ping back to the vessel every 15 minutes. And within that ping, they can send very short text messages like the old text system that we had before we had uh, smartphones, you know, abbreviations for words and stuff. So they could send the message, the ship could send the message down to the submersible saying, go 100 meters to your left for Titanic, things like that. So that's very rudimentary. Um, there is no uh, GPS and all that kind of stuff, obviously, because they're underwater. Uh, the sound waves do travel through the water, but obviously there's a limit of how far that they can go and, how, and the equipment that can pick it up. Um, now... One of the things that they've all been going on about is the amount of air that this vessel has uh, for to, for the people to be able to breathe. Now, what they have on board is they have air for about four days, uh, and, and also they have a scrubber system similar to what they have on spacecrafts that converts carbon dioxide back into breathable air. They also have backup scrubbers, and they also have, for a final you know, emergency, they have scuba tanks underneath the, the floors in the floorboards in there so they can lift the floors up and they can pull out some scuba tanks and, and use those for breathing. One of the things that hasn't really been mentioned is how much water they have. Human body can only survive about three days without any water. So, um, you know, that is equally as important, if, you know, if, if you've got no water on board. Now, from what we understand, 
they only they each took on a canister of water the, the dive itself was meant to last about eight hours so it's i think it's two and a half hours down three four hours on the surface or on the on the seabed and then uh, and then two and a half hours back up again and they lost communication around an hour and 45 minutes to, on that dive and they obviously the dive as uh, was a to twelve and a half thousand feet, which is three thousand eight hundred meters down. Now, what most likely has happened? Uh, well, obviously, it's all conjecture at this point. Um, there could have been a power loss, which would have cut off the communications. Um, they have, according to one report, uh, seven types of redundant systems on board to refloat this vessel if they get into trouble. And a, n a number of those systems work if there's a power failure. So, if all the lights go out and there's no power they can still resurface this vessel there are weights that they can drop to make to create buoyancy uh, there are um, propellers that that point up to push the vessel up and there are the airbags that can be inflated to lift the vessel up to the surface now one idea is that the vessel has surfaced and it's bobbing around on the water waiting to be picked up this is unlikely it's possible but it's unlikely and the reason why is because if they were on the surface they could use radios to communicate now they might only have vhf radios or shortwave radios on the vessel but with all of the searching that's going on aircraft and stuff like that any calls from a, even a vhf radio which has got a range of about what 22 miles um they would have been picked up by now so that's unlikely to have happened that there are aircraft searching and i know lots of vessels in the area currently searching Speaking of the area, because of the underwater currents and stuff, this vessel could have been, if it lost power, it could be pushed off. It could be almost anywhere in the North Atlantic. So it is a really big area to search. Now, another thing to take into consideration is, you know, if even if they did find it and it was down, you know, 12,000 meters, this is the only vessel that can go that deep. Uh, the only vessel left in existence that can dive to those depths. So even if they could get a vessel that could go to those depths it might you know if it's in the uk or it's in australia they, they can't get it there in time before the air runs out on that vessel um so yeah and like even military submarines cannot go down to the to that depth so the, yeah it's, it's quite a bleak outlook to be honest what has happened now a couple of things really that's probable that that could have happened either the vessel was was caught on something like one of those nets that gets cut away from fishing the, the big nets ghost nets uh, another possibility uh, and probably the most likely is that the vessel had a leak on the way down and if that was the case the amount of pressure that's on that vessel at those depths would have been instant implosion so the fact that there's no communication or there's there's nothing from the vessel and it hasn't refloated and stuff like that, it seems to suggest that there might have been a catastrophic failure. Obviously, that's just conjecture, uh, but we will keep uh, monitoring this uh, and we'll let you know if we have any updates. All right, so we're going to move on to uh, Motia Alpha Nero. Now, we mentioned in the video on Friday that the vessel had been sold in a public to watch auction that was posted online quite incredible now the the vessel sold for 67.6 million dollars and they also the name of the bidder was announced as eric schmidt who is the one of the founders and former ceo of google now i can't tell you how rare it is that the name and the price paid for a yacht at auction is to be to be announced publicly that is extremely rare uh, it's it's all about discretion this industry so it's it's extremely rare and the fact that it's a high profile american who's bought it now it might have been one of the conditions of the auction uh that they had to announce who it was now eric schmidt obviously like i said former ceo of google now one one person said to me he's an experienced owner and with an almost unlimited budget so why buy a contentious asset that is going to be splashed all over the media could have bought or even built any yacht he wanted so why attract all the inevitable attention that's a very good question isn't it why would you do that knowing that the previous owner is a, is a russian billionaire and and also the fact that he is trying to get that vessel back um so the possible reasons for him buying it schmidt buying it it could be that he plans to flip the the purchase and sell it on 
there has been a claim on the vessel. Uh, now, after months of denying ownership of this vessel, and Mr. Andrew Geryev, uh, including directly to us, we contacted uh, his lawyers, his English lawyers, and they denied that he owns uh, Alfa Nero and Luminosity, which is in Montenegro. They filed a last minute injunction uh, in the court in Antigua, lawyers representing Andrei Geryev's daughter, who claims to own the yacht. So, yeah, so you can make up your mind, either Andre Geryev's daughter owns it. Now, when we contacted the lawyers who represent Andre Geryev, would they not say, actually, uh, he doesn't own it, but it belongs to his daughter? Why would they just say, no, he doesn't own it? That captain of that vessel is now working for the Antiguan government. He knows who owns the vessel. The crew who work on board know who owns the vessel. We've had multiple former crew members of Alpha Nero contact us and tell us that they know who owns the vessel. They all point to Mr. Andre Geyev, including former crew members of Motiot Luminosity. They also point to Mr. Andre Geyev. There is going to be a long drawn out court battle, I think, in Antigua. And I think it's going to sit there for quite a while yet. Now, the Antigua government have said that if the money is not transferred within, I think it's a week, that they will offer it to the second highest bidder. So I would say that Mr. Schmidt will, is probably being very cautious right now about handing over $67 million for a yacht that is still going through a legal process in Antigua. Anyway, we will keep you updated as we have done throughout this whole thing. Okay, we've got one last thing before we go. This is about motor yacht Pure, which is formerly known as Sarafsa. This is the vessel that was once owned by Saudi Prince and was seized by the bank and sold on. Now, we've, we, we know who bought it, or we, we think we know who bought it, and we know what the plans are for that vessel. Now, what we've been told is that it's going to get a 50 million euro refit, including a seven meter extension. Uh, so they're going to extend the vessel by seven meters, which probably means it's going to get a stern extension. That's the most common type of extension that is done on a yacht. Uh, and it was bought, we believe, by Olivier Leclerc, who is the son of the Decathlon founder, Michel Leclerc. Now, uh, Olivier Leclerc is a hotelier, designer, and owner of Olivarius Hotels, a private equity investor uh, in California. Uh, so yeah, so he's the lucky buyer of that vessel, and it's gonna finally get a decent paint job by the sounds of it. Um, so a $50 million uh, refit, which is actually more than the vessel sold for. So he's going to he's putting a lot of money into that vessel. Okay, be sure to check out our new channel, Super Yacht News. You can find it by typing at Yacht News into YouTube, or there's a link in the description below. We basically take these longer form videos, we chop them up into small videos, and we put them on that channel. There's also some exclusive uh, news stories up for that channel as well. So if you're not a subscriber, please be sure to subscribe. And check out our Patreon channel as well at patreon.com slash esisman. Uh, you'll find behind the scenes videos not published on YouTube. Uh, you'll get to see other videos not published on YouTube, like the Patreon chat series and the Atlantic vlog series. You get early access to features without any adverts. Uh, you get to ask, ask questions for Patreon only Q&As, and we've just put a Q&A out there recently. Be sure to check that out. There's a link in the description. If you've got any information about any of the stories we covered tonight or any other stories, please be sure to get in touch. You can do that at the About page of the YouTube channel on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook Messenger, and you can also get us on Threema. Be sure to like this video, very important for the algorithm. Hit the uh, subscribe button and hit the bell for future notifications. All right, guys, thanks very much, and I'll catch up with you soon. Bye-bye.